morning again. We're so glad you've come into church with us this morning from wherever you are. Welcome to the church at Grace Park. That song comes partially out of the book of Isaiah chapter 43. Do not be afraid for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned up. The flames will not consume you, for I am the Lord, your God. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will gather you and your children. Good morning, church. Those promises are ours today. We're gonna to continue to worship the Lord together here in just a few minutes by singing to him. I just wanna take a moment and make a few announcements. We're so glad you're with us. We hope you'll take just a moment right now to do an online meet and greet. So wherever you are, if you would comment letting us know where you are, if you're a regular attender of the church at Grace Park or a guest or a visitor with us today online, we'd love to know that you're with us and where you're watching us and worshiping with us. So please do that, say, hey, I'm from Portland, Tennessee or I'm from Portland, Oregon, wherever you are right now. Would you let us know where you are? And then we also have just a couple of announcements. You know, one thing about not being able to meet together that has been a challenge is to remain connected to each other. So we're trying some things here as a church. We launched them this week. It's hashtag Grace Park at home. Every day we're bringing some sort of connection point to you, a noontime prayer on all of our social media, as well um, as some other things every day, some content from medical professionals, Bible study material. Uh, we even have one of our church members who's doing a cooking segment. You know, there's a lot that we're trying to do just to stay together with each other, knowing that as we scatter to our separate places, it's so easy to feel isolated and alone, and we want to remain connected to each other. So we hope that you'll check that out, hashtag Grace Park at home. And one of the things that we're most excited about as a church is the opportunity to put Bible study materials in your hand. Maybe you've been a Christian for a really long time, or maybe you're not so sure what this Christian thing is all about, but we've got some materials that we can put in your hand if you want to visit our website. Click on the digital campus, gracepark.org is our website. The digital campus has a free Bible study for you, videos, materials for adults, and videos and materials for children. We hope that it will be a great time for you in your home to come into the Word of God and to know what God has to say to you, for you, and about you. But right now, we're going to continue to worship together. We are going to sing to the one and the way. Let's worship together. Come on, y'all. together.
we're going to continue in worship together through um, the giving of the Lord's tithes and our offering. You know, you can do this anytime. It doesn't have to be right now. But we believe that um, the offering and the tithe are an act of worship, an act of obedience and generosity back to the Lord who has given us so much. So we always take time during our time of worship to do this together. So let's pray together for a moment. And we invite you to give at give.gracepark.org as we finish singing together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everything you have done in and for and through us. We worship you now, giving back to you obediently and generously. Lord, take what we give, use it to make your name great here and around the world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Father, you are our story, that we were created for you, that we were created to serve you and to know you and to be in relationship with you. So, Father, even in times that feel uncertain, remind us today that you hold us in your grip. Remind us that you are working all things together for our good, Father, and help us to listen to you, to surrender to you, and to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a joy to be here today, but I want to thank this whole team. I also want to thank Anthony and Tracy for meeting up here early yesterday with Brother Ray Newman and Brother Albert Dittis, who prepared some worship time and uh, sweet time, sweet moments for those of you who typically worship with us at the 8 o'clock service. Well, this is a new experience for me. Uh, I hope I seem somewhat relaxed to you who are out there watching in your homes, although I'm not. I'm more nervous than normally I am preaching to a room full of people. But I know that this is God's will for us right now, and I'm so thankful for technology. Uh, I have been out for the past few Sundays. I uh, had foot surgery a few weeks ago that was somewhat invasive. I still can't drive. I have to depend on my Uber driver, my precious wife, to get me around. But I've been home watching the services on live stream. And I want to thank Brother Dan Adams, uh, who spoke for us on uh, Sunday, March the 8th. And uh, I was home recovering from surgery. That was my first Sunday there in my house watching the services online. And Dan preached to us that day on giving. He challenged us as a church in the area of stewardship of our gifts and abilities and resources to the Lord to be faithful in that way. Little did we know that the following Sunday that we would not be meeting and assembling publicly like this. And I just want to uh, pause for a moment and thank you for the way you have supported the church, the work of the Lord. You know, there were a lot of fears among pastors when 
We couldn't have services. The number one fear was when people don't come, they won't give. I can honestly say I gave that to the Lord. And my concern is that during this time, we grow in our faith and our love and our walk of integrity with the Lord. But I believe that God orchestrated it, so he used Dan's challenge that day. And uh, it's bringing forth fruit now. You have given faithfully. We have come close to meeting budget overall for the last uh, two Sundays. And this week looks like a good week for us online. So thank you. Those of you who are giving online, those of you who are dropping your checks in the mail, those of you who are coming by the office during the week, I just want to thank you for continuing to show your love and fidelity to the Lord and to his church. And then I want to thank Brother Doug Thornton, who has preached so ably the last two Sundays. My, I have so much been encouraged and strengthened and fed through Brother Doug's preaching. And uh, he and Miss Debbie, his wife, are wonderful gifts to Grace Park. I'm thankful that the Lord brought them back here. They were part of our church family. We had the blessing of ordaining Brother Doug. He's been away pastoring a rural church uh, down in Davidson County for two and a half years. But they have recently joined our staff and just in the nick of time. And he's been such a great help uh, during these weeks that I've been out. And he's going to be doing a lot of preaching, a lot of the preaching on Sunday mornings in the weeks and months ahead. Well, I want you to come with me today to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. As you turn your Bible or your devices to Jeremiah, chapter 17, I will turn mine. As I turn, I want to thank uh, Coach Jeff Porter, who's our assistant principal, and Miss Shelley Carlson, another assistant principal that we have, and Miss Tracy Pugh, uh, our school secretary, and Miss Amanda Riley, and all of those who've helped uh, prepare our school to go online uh, tomorrow. So you pray for our faculty, you pray for our admin team, you pray for our students, pray for our parents. Uh, this is a new reality. Uh, we're we're uh, sailing uncharted waters, and so I pray that it will go well. We've been spending most of our time the last week and a half trying to prepare and become equipped and ready for that. So. Uh, it's just amazing how God has met the need. He has sent us people who has uh, stood in the gap, and we're wanting to go forward with his work. I can't thank the Lord enough for Tracy and Anthony and all that they're doing and will be doing in the weeks to come to keep our services online. I want you to come to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17. Early this week, when I began to pray about what to bring to you this morning, began to seek the Lord's face as to how he would have me to share with you. I, I think it was Monday or Tuesday in my quiet time. I did something that I often do. I would go back maybe a month, month and a half and read my journal and to read my devotional reflections uh, from the previous few weeks. And uh, I started back in February. I wanted to just read each day's devotional reflection, how God was speaking to me. And I came to February the 17th. And on February the 17th, Jeremiah 17 was a great blessing to me. And I made a note, maybe I'll preach on this someday in the future. And so as I was reflecting this week, the Lord seemed to say, this is what I want you to share with my people this coming Sunday morning. So, I want you to come with me to Jeremiah chapter 17. And I want to give you a little background of the prophet Jeremiah and the book of Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah was called to be a prophet when he was a young man, maybe in his early teens. It's an exciting passage of Scripture to read. I wish we had time to go back and study that this morning. But I would challenge all of you teenagers and even all of you uh, primaries and juniors out there listening. Maybe your dad and mom or one of them can read uh, the account this week to you in Jeremiah chapter 1, how God told Jeremiah, he said, before you were ever conceived, I knew you and I called you and I set you apart to be my preacher. And so parents, I want to say to you, uh, God has a purpose. He has a special plan for your children. 
They were his before they were yours. If I could relive my years. Sorry. I would be a better dad. I would be a better dad. I'll say a little more about that in a few moments. But God had a special place for Jeremiah, and God has a special place and plan for your children because they were his before they were yours, Dad and Mom. But he's entrusted them to us to steward them and to guide them and to mold them in the ways of the Lord. He has given to you and to me as parents the great responsibility of creating a desire in them, not for the world, but for him and his kingdom. And so God called Jeremiah when he was a young man. Jeremiah never married. (laughs) Thus, he never had any children uh, because of the call of God upon his life. He felt that God wanted him to focus on his calling and to focus on calling the nation of Judah back to the Lord. I can remember, I can remember uh, when I was in college, uh, I was sharing with my wife this story this week. She didn't know this. I said, I can remember when I was in college, uh, I can remember saying, Lord, I don't want to be like Jeremiah. (laughs) For the Oscar, I had the fear that I may end up being a single preacher. I wanted to be married. I wanted to have a companion in life to to go with me through my ministry. And uh, so my wife's counsel to me, well, don't go there. They've heard all about your life (laughs) when you were in college, uh, praying for your future wife. But I, I was going through these thoughts when you know, I had this girl who was my girlfriend then. She's now my wife today, and she, she would jilt me, and then we'd get back together, and she'd jilt me again, and we'd get back together. And it was in those times that she would jilt me for the other guy. I had a competitor that I'd say, Lord, are you going to let her jilt me one last time, and she's going to end up marrying this guy, and I'm going to end up single, and if I can't have her, I don't want anybody else. And so I really did. I had a fear of, of going through life without a companion. But you know what? Jeremiah was surrendered to whatever God had for him. And so he never married. He never had children. He was called the weeping prophet. He labored for 40 years, boldly proclaiming unwelcome truth about impending captivity for God's people, Judah. And he never had a convert as far as we know. He had few friends that encouraged him, that stood with him. Dr. Walker, our Bible teacher here at our school, asked me this week. He came by my office one day, and he was talking about Jeremiah. He didn't know that I would be preaching on him today. And he said, how would you like if God had called you, Pastor Bob, uh, into the ministry and told you ahead of time that you were going to be preaching for over 40 years, but you wouldn't have any converts? But that's how focused and how devoted and how surrendered Jeremiah was. And so you know a little bit about Jewish history. If you don't, I'll just really cover that quickly for you, but Israel was born through Abraham, and Abraham had Isaac and Jacob, and they were the, the patriarchs of the nation of Israel, and then Jacob had 12 sons. The one that's probably the most famous to us was Joseph, and uh, Joseph ended up down in Egypt. God used him to, to save his people from famine. They came into Egypt. He saved the nation. Later on, after Joseph died, God raised up Moses. Through Moses led the Hebrew people out of Egypt into the promised land. Moses died in that process. God raised up Joshua as the general. He took them on into the promised land. And then we went through the period of the judges, the last of which was Samuel. And it was then that the Jews came to Samuel and said, Samuel, we want a king. And so Samuel tried to coach them. They didn't listen to him. And so kingdom was born. And Saul was the first king, then David, and then Solomon. We know that to be the united kingdom. Uh, It lasted for about 120 years. And then the kingdom divided, and the northern part of the kingdom containing 10 tribes was known as, as Israel. And then the southern kingdom containing two tribes was known as Judah. 
the southern kingdom outlasted the northern kingdom. They got away from God. They didn't have one good king. And God allowed the Assyrians to come in and capture the northern kingdom. And then the southern kingdom lived on for another approximately 140 years. And they had some good kings and bad kings. And it was in the last days of the southern kingdom, it was in the last days of Judah and Jerusalem that God raised up Jeremiah. And he said, Jeremiah, I want you to go and tell my people to come back to me or else they're going to be taken into captivity. They're going to pay for turning their hearts away from me. They're going to go through a lot of suffering if they don't come back to me. And so Jeremiah preached that message, but he always preached it with tears of compassion. He never ceased to love his nation. He never gave up on them. He never lost hope. And it was like he was at the ringside seat watching his messages come to fulfillment. And, and after the fall of Jerusalem in 586, a few, years, a few years after that, Jeremiah died. And the nation of Judah went into captivity for 70 long years. So it was during this time that God raised up Jeremiah to preach to his people. And that brings us to this passage. And I know we took a little while to get the background, but I think it's important sometimes to get the background so we can see how applicable and relevant it is to our day to day. So in Jeremiah chapter 17, he comes to the people of God in the nation of Judah in their last days, their last few years of existence. He's wanting them to hear him. And he says, basically, I want to present to you two ways of life. There are two ways that you can live as God's people. And so I want to say to you today, dear Christians, there are two ways that we can live. You know, we not only have a choice between heaven and hell, but once we come to know Christ and receive him as our Savior, we have to choose between living for the Lord with a whole heart or living for him with a half heart. And I pray that today our Lord may call our hearts back to him. If we've been flirting with the world, if we've turned our affections to the world, if we have gone to bed with the world and our lives have become pregnant with sin because we've been unfaithful to our Lord, I pray that today will be a time that we'll say, you know what? I want to, I want to draw nearer. I want to draw closer to my Lord. So here's the passage. In Jeremiah chapter 17, Jeremiah says this, verse 5, Thus says the Lord, that phrase appears about 350 times in the Old Testament, 157 times just in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, thus says the Lord. He wanted them to know this was not his word, but God's word. And Jeremiah said, cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. Salt is used symbolically in different ways in the scriptures. Sometimes it's used and it symbolized purification. Uh, Jesus used it to represent the Christian's role in the world. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth. Uh, in another place, he was preaching, and he said, uh, salt is good, but when it loses its savor, its influence, its tastiness, uh, it's, it's good for nothing. Uh, Paul, the apostle, said that as Christians just navigating through a broken world, that we're to season our speech with salt. So salt symbolizes our role in the world. But here, salt is representing desolation and judgment. And it's the picture of a child of God whose heart has turned away from the Lord. And so Jeremiah presents the first part of the contrast. Cursed is the man who trusts in mankind and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert and shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land, desolate land, land of judgment, which is not inhabited. But then here's the beautiful part of the contrast. And this is what I want to focus on. And this is where we're going to land today. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river and will not fear when heat comes. 
but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Jeremiah said, O people of God, he said, don't trust mankind. Don't trust what the world and the earth provides to find your meaning and fulfillment and security and purpose in life. Trust the Lord. And he says, you won't be like a shrub. You'll be like a tree planted by the waters. And he says, your leaf will be green and you will always be bearing fruit. You won't be shriveling up like a shrub in the scorching sun of a desert. So today, my prayer is this. Long introduction. My sermon I've got to make in an abbreviated fashion. But let me just pray before we finish up our message. Dear Lord, I thank you for the prophet Jeremiah. I thank you, dear Lord, for his words. Boldly proclaimed, even when they weren't welcomed. And so, dear God, I pray that you will use his words today to speak to all of us. Thank you for everyone who's listening. Thank you, dear Lord, for the the miracle of modern technology. Thank you for the dear people here who've provided the worship and music today and song. And thank you for those who are making this telecast possible through live stream. And now I pray, dear God, that you would use it and help my words to be succinct. But Lord, help me to share your word, your message, your heart today with your people is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to share an article that I heard briefly alluded to on Fox News Friday night. I went online yesterday. This was an article that came out in Friday's Wall Street Journal. And I don't normally read extensive newspaper articles, and this will take me two or three minutes or so. But listen, this is an article written, came out in Friday's Wall Street Journal, and I was shocked. The Wall Street Journal published this article, and the title of it is A Coronavirus Great Awakening. And it was written by Robert Nicholson, but the tagline was, sometimes the most important ingredient for spiritual renewal is a cataclysmic event. Mr. Nicholson said this, could a plague of biblical proportions be America's best hope for religious revival? As the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II approaches, there is reason to think so. Three quarters of a century has dimmed the memory of that gruesome conflict and its terrible consequences. September 2, 1939. September 1, 1939. World War II began September 2, 1945. It ended six years and a day. This coming September 2nd, we'll celebrate 75th anniversary since World War II ended. And so he uses that. He says, three quarters of a century has dimmed the memory of that gruesome conflict and its terrible consequences. Tens of millions killed. Great cities bombed to rubble. Europe and Asia stricken by hunger and poverty. Those who survived the war had to grapple with kinds of profound questions that only arise in the aftermath of calamity. Gazing at the ruins from his window at Cambridge University, British historian Herbert Burnerfield chose to make sense of it by turning to the Hebrew Bible. Butterfield wrote in 1949, following the end of World War II, he wrote in his book, Christianity and History, it is almost in possible properly to appreciate the higher developments in the historical reflection of the Old Testament, except in another age which has experienced or has found itself confronted with colossal cataclysm. And then he wrote, Americans chastened by the horrors of war turned to faith in search of truth and meaning. In the late 1940s, Gallup surveys showed that more than three quarters of Americans were members of a house of worship and went back to church. Congress added the words, and I quote, under God to the Pledge of Allegiance in 1954. Some would later call this a third great awakening. And then Mr. Nicholson says, today the world faces another moment of cataclysm. 
Though less devastating than one world too, the pandemic has remade everyday life and wrecked the global economy in a way that feels apocalyptic. The experience is new and disorienting. Life had been deceptively easy until now. Our ancestors' lives, by contrast, were guaranteed to be short and painful. The lucky ones survived birth. The luckier ones made it past childhood. Only in the past 200 years has humanity truly taken off. See, this puts it in perspective. We now float through a normal and expected world of air conditioning, 9-11 call centers, medicine to treat pain and fever, pocket-sized computers containing nearly the sum of human knowledge. He says, we think we have taken control of our own fate, and God has become irrelevant. He went on to say, men may live to a great age in days of comparative quietness and peaceful progress without ever having come to grips with the universe, without ever vividly realizing the problems and the paradoxes with which humanity and human history so often confront us. Butterfield wrote, we of the 12th century, we of the 20th century, he wrote this in 49, we of the 20th century have been particularly spoiled for the men of the Old Testament, the ancient Greeks, and all our ancestors down to the 17th century demonstrate their philosophy and their outlook with a terrible awareness of the chanceness of human life and the precarious nature of man's existence in this risky universe. Now, hang in here, okay? Bear with me. Then Mr. Nicholson said this, and I almost read this with tears. I've read this several times, and it brings me to tears every time. Mr. Nicholson, the writer of this article, said, the past four years have been some of the most contentious and embarrassing years in American history. Squabbling over trivialities has left the public frantic and divided, oblivious to the transcendent. But the pandemic has humbled the country and opened millions of eyes to this risky universe once more. Sheer grimness of suffering brings men sometimes into a profounder understanding of human destiny. Mr. Butterfield wrote, sometimes Mr. Butterfield said, and I quote, it is only by a cataclysm that man can make his escape from the net which he has taken so much trouble to weave around himself. For society is founded on the biblical tradition, cataclysms need not mark the end. They are a call for repentance and revival. As the coronavirus pandemic subjects U.S. hospitals to a fearsome test, Americans can find solace in the same place that Butterfield did. And listen to this. Great struggle can produce great clarity. Could a rogue virus lead to a grand creative moment in Americans in America's history will Americans shaken by the reality of a risky universe rediscover the God who proclaimed himself sovereign over every catastrophe wow what a great article you know what I'm praying I am praying that God will turn what we are experiencing into a grand creative moment in the history of America. And if it happens, it will happen first in the house of God. It will happen first with God's people. It will happen when God's people say, I don't want to trust flesh. I don't want to look to mankind. My heart is not attached to the world and its false idols. You know, we have our idols today. Money, possessions, pleasure, entertainment, ego, image, success, achievement, power, and many others. And that's where we often find our hearts attached. It's to what the world offers. It's not to what Jesus promises and provides. 
The grand creative moment in our nation's history will happen when we as God's people say, I don't want to trust in the flesh. I don't want to look to the world. I don't want to trust in mankind. My heart, trust in the Lord. The word trust in the Old Testament is synonymous to the word faith and belief in the New Testament. And it means to lean upon, to depend upon, to roll yourself upon the God of creation and to the Christ of the cross. That's where we find our hope. That's where we find our purpose. That's where we find our joy. That's where we find our excitement. That's where we find our meaning in life. It's in the Lord. It's not in the world. And when we make that choice, Jeremiah says, you'll be like a tree planted by waters. The winds of adversity will blow. The heat will turn up its temperature but you've got a constant source of enablement. And he says, your leaf will always be green because of this constant supply and this constant source of water. And there, water is symbolic of, and the scripture uses this language, you're planted in the house of the Lord. You're planted in the word of God. The word of God is often symbolized by water. You're planted in your intimacy and fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So a tree with its roots spreading outward and downward by the water is a Christian who says, I want to be intimate with the Lord's church. I want to be intimate with the word. I want to be intimate with the Holy Spirit. And you walk in that enablement every day. And when the winds of adversity come and the heat comes, whether it's coronavirus or whether it's tornadoes, or hurricanes, or sickness, or death, or whatever it is, your leaf is green. You'll keep bearing fruit, and you'll be a witness to a watching world. And I love this. He says, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, and whose hope is in the Lord, for he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when he... For today, dear...